Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 1. We are getting back to the prayer that Paul prayed over the church at Philippi. Uh, Many applications that we can use here at the church at New Providence as well. And the theme of his prayer is growing in godliness. He prayed for the things to be true in the believers' lives at Philippi that would be evidence of someone or a group of someone's growing in their relationship with God. And as we've studied already, uh, we know that the first three essentials are love, excellence, and integrity. Today we're going to look at the good works that are produced by those who are growing in godliness. And then the last one we'll have is just being able to glorify God more and more each day, which is our prayer. And so as you look at Philippians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 9 through 11. And if you'll stand with me as we do that, uh, which is the recording of those five essentials. Beginning in verse 9, it says, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Father, as we look at your word Once again today in the book of Philippians, that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write. Father, I pray that we will find these elements or essentials of growing in godliness to be true in our own lives. Lord, I also pray that we would find them to be true in our church life. Father, as we grow closer to you, may we be better able to glorify you each step of the way. Please fill our hearts this morning with your Holy Spirit. Uh, Captivate us. Hold us captive to your word and what it has to say. And may we walk out of here in a closer walk with your son Jesus because of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to go back and do a little bit of a recap since we kind of Uh, skipped a week on studying this prayer with an evangelism training last week uh, and just go back and label each one of the requests that he made. And if you look in verse 9, the Apostle Paul's first request that he made to the Lord on behalf of the believers at Philippi was that they would grow in love. He made this request first because he knew that beyond a shadow of a doubt, if if they're going to grow in any other area... They first have to grow in this foundational virtue of love. And the, the word translated love in verse 9, when it says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, is the word agape. So we know it's a God kind of love, an unconditional love, a love the way God loves. And all throughout Scripture, uh, John 15, 1 John, the entire book, and many other passages, it is evident uh, that God expects us to display who we are and who we belong to by the way that we love. How we love God in our devotion to Him. He says, what's the, uh, he was asked by a religious leader, what's the greatest commandment of all? And he says, first, that you love God with all that you are. Secondly, that you love your neighbor as yourself. On these uh, hinge the whole law. This sums up the whole law. And so we know that love is so foundational. And just as a reminder of what we've talked about in the, uh, the preceding weeks leading up to today, these are progressional requests, meaning that they are building off of each other. It's not by happenstance that he listed them in this order as he's praying for the believers at Philippi. No, he said, Lord, I pray first that they will grow in love because that will be the platform for which all these other essentials will build off of. In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge 
and all discernment. After he prayed for love, he prayed for excellence. If you look at the, the next part, it says that you may approve the things that are excellent. And the transitional words here that indicate the progression is the word that. Or some translations have so that. Grow in love so that you can approve the things that are excellent. And as we studied that, just to jog your memory a little bit there, or, or to inform you if you weren't with us on that day, to approve the things that are excellent means to dig, to discern, to decipher, to, to prove the value and the originality and the genuineness of the gold that you have found. When you go to Scripture, you're digging to find things to apply to your life. And excellence is the result of applying those things. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. I want to read a, a passage there that kind of highlights what it means to approve that which is excellent. Look at verses 8 and 9. It says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. This is an example of growing in approving that which is excellent. Growing in excellence. And, and that's what we're supposed to do when we go to the Word of God. We are earnestly digging and researching and proving in our own lives the excellence of God's Word. And that's what we are supposed to be growing in. The third essential that the Apostle Paul prayed for. He says, if, you, if they'll grow in love, then they'll grow, grow in approving that which is excellent. And then a result of that will be that they will grow in integrity. They will grow in sincerity. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Now the progression here is excellence is digging for that which will change your life. Integrity is the result of applying it to your life. So we have search for and approve that which is excellent. Apply it to your life and be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ Jesus, uh, until he returns. And the sincerity and without offense simply means a, a cohesiveness. It means that no matter what area of my life you look at, you're going to find characteristic of a growing believer. You're going to find godliness affecting every aspect of my life. Everything that I say, everything that I do, and no matter what circumstance I get in, and the, the example we used was that of a clay pot. And if that pot is true to form and is cohesive all the way around with no cracks in it, then no matter how hot of a liquid you pour in it, it's going to hold true and do exactly what it was purchased for and created for. And, and we want that to be true of our lives, but as we progress in our Christian walk, the prayer is, here from the Apostle Paul, is that we would grow in our sincerity. That we would grow in our blamelessness until the day of Christ Jesus, in our integrity. Which leads us up to the one we're going to spend most of the time on today. And that is, in verse 11, that we would also grow in good works. And what the Word says there in Philippians chapter 1 is being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. The fourth essential of growing in godliness. Now in this text, Paul calls good works fruits of righteousness. The language is still progressive. We need not miss that. Meaning that when you grow in your love for God and your love for others, you will then grow in searching for that which is excellent. You will grow in integrity. And all of these together will produce more good works in your life. More works of righteousness. 
and a, a guaranteed, emphatic statement that we need to be able to make about our lives in Jesus Christ is that works will follow. Not might follow, because we've got a lot of people claiming to have been Christians for a long time. That I meet people all the time that have been Christians, or, or they claim to be Christians longer than I've been alive, but yet you assess fruits, and they're not there. And, and shouldn't we be able to assume that as someone grows in godliness, that their works will become more and more? Just as a, a, a seasoned tree, produce, um, a mature tree produces more fruit than a seedling does. And we grow in, in the production of those fruits. James spent much time on this truth and the seriousness of it. And I want you to see that today. Turn with me to James chapter 2. I want to read a couple of verses there regarding these works that we ought to be able to expect to be visible in the life of a believer who's growing in godliness. James chapter 2 Look at verse 14. <clears throat> what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead." But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was, likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the me messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now let me caution you on one thing. James is not saying that works save you. What James is saying is that if you have saving faith, that faith will make itself visible by works. So therefore, if you don't have works, you don't have the kind of faith that saves you. That faith will always be accompanied by works. That's, uh, that's why Jesus Christ taught in Matthew 7 that you can know a tree by its fruit. You can look at the fruit that that tree is producing and tell what kind of tree it is. It's because our faith will make itself visible in the way we live our lives. Now going back to Philippians 1, I want to look at a few words that are used here uh, to, in this prayer that Paul prayed for an increase of good works. The phrase being filled and, and sometimes translated having been filled field, little English lesson, lesson, that is a perfect passive participle. What that means is it refers to something that happened in the past, but has continuing results. So it's, it's referring to something that took place in complete form in the past, but continues to affect 
on an ongoing basis. Being filled, having been filled, which means the reference here is that at the point we were redeemed in Christ, we were given the ability to do all that God demands of us. Every bit of it. You were given the ability at your conversion to uphold the demands of God's Scripture, of God's Word. But because we continue to battle with this sin and this old dead flesh that we drag around, we have to grow in that ability. We have to progress in using the ability that God has already given us. Kind of brings a new light to Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not lacking anything that is needed to uphold what God asks of me. That has all been given to me in Christ. But I have to grow in the use of that ability. I have to grow in the good works, the fruits of righteousness. And, and that's huge because so many Christians say the, that the demands are just too steep. I, I don't have what it takes. I'm, I'm not worthy. Well, we are actually dethroning Christ when we say that. We are saying that having Christ given to us in fullness and His Holy Spirit indwelling us is not enough. What more is there? You have been that, that been, having been filled or being filled... You have been given everything you need to produce fruits of righteousness. Paul's prayer is that you grow in using that ability that God has given you. As we grow in love, as we grow in excellence, as we grow in integrity, we will also grow in displaying the fruits of righteousness that we have been given by the Holy Spirit at conversion. The hope is that you are displaying more of those fruits today than you were able to display on the day of your salvation. The hope is that today you are glorifying God through your deeds more than you were able to do yesterday. Why? Because it's a constant progression toward godliness. A constant progression in pleasing God through obedience. So we ask the question. I, I think it's very important for us to answer this question this morning. And that is, what exactly are these fruits of righteousness that we're supposed to be growing in? What exactly are these works that prove that our faith is alive? And I'll give a, a, a simple answer. It has two parts. Uh, not only does a work have to be obedience to God's word in order to be a good work, but it also has to be done with the right motivation. And so the definition of a fruit of righteousness is a deed that is performed in obedience to God's commands with the motivation of glorifying God. Example of why it needs that motivation. If I were to go up to a homeless person at a stop sign and I hang a dollar out the window with hopes that the person behind me watches me do this benevolent act. Is the act that I just committed a good deed? And the answer is no, because it was done with the wrong motivation. But what if I pulled up and uh, I said, come here for a minute. And I, I didn't want anybody to see what I was doing. And I said, I want to help you. I want to get you some food. I want to help meet the needs that you have. As we talked about in James 2, if a man says he's... Uh, not clothed sufficiently for the weather, he says he's, he's starving and I don't do anything to meet those needs, then, then what good is my faith in that, in, in that situation or that scenario? And I do it to meet the need so that God can be glorified and I don't want any recognition, don't want anybody to see, so much so that I try to do what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't even let my right hand know what my left hand was doing was that a good deed and we would say yes because it was done with the motivation of glorifying God it was in obedience to his commands and for the purpose of glorifying him that's what a work of righteousness or a fruit of righteousness is 
Uh, Paul knew that right deeds came from right attitudes. And so that's what he listed when he listed the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Uh, you, you're probably familiar with that list in verses 22 and 23 of Galatians 5. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Nine attitudes, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Question is, if these attitudes produce fruits of righteousness, am I growing in these attitudes? So, so just do a, an honest, personal assessment. It's, it's very convicting to do this, but it's one that we should be doing on a daily basis. Today, am I better able to love, have joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Do these nine attitudes characterize me more today than they did yesterday? How am I doing in this uh, nine-point physical checkup, spiritual checkup, and then the actions that stem from them, are they growing? And that would be evidence of growing in godliness. Am I growing in these nine areas and in the works that stem from these attitudes? Or how about this one? This, this just came to me. Would someone use these nine attitudes to describe me if they were assessing my life? One of the fruits of righteousness that is fresh on our minds that should increasingly take up more of our time as we grow is evangelism. We had a training last week on how to evangelize through simple conversation. Uh, that was just one method uh, with the importance of verbalizing the gospel. But evangelism, the reason I bring it up again this week is because that tends to be an area of the Christian's life that we don't grow in. And I think the reason is we are perfectly content with letting someone else do it. If we're honest, I, I have to say that about myself. Oh, I'm glad he told him about Jesus because I, I thought I was going to have to. You know, we, we're perfectly content with letting the pastors do it. We're perfectly content with letting an evangelist do it. But we cannot deny the fact that the great commission of go and make disciples of all nations was given to every one of Christ's disciples. And so evangelism is a call, is a fruit of righteousness that needs to be flowing out of every one of us. And more so as we grow in godliness. The 2000 Baptist Faith and Message, which is the confession of faith that we hold to here at New Providence, says this, and I quote from it on evangelism. It is the duty and privilege of every follower of Christ and of every church of the Lord Jesus Christ to endeavor to make disciples of all nations. It is the duty and the privilege. Recognize both of those. The duty and the privilege of every follower of Christ and of every church of the Lord Jesus Christ to endeavor to make disciples of all nations. To quote Lee Scarborough, uh, as he emphasized the responsibility of every Christian to be a witness for Christ, he said these words, The divine obligation of soul winning rests without exception upon every child of God. The Christian receives the essence of this obligation and the call at the time of his salvation. And then listen to this. This is an interesting statement. The fruit of a Christian is another Christian. Evangelism, discipleship, go and make disciples. When we uh, share the gospel, when we pour into others and, and they begin growing, maybe they're a Timothy to us. 
uh, those are fruits of righteousness as well. At any cost, we are to go into all the world and to all individuals of every nation, to every creature, and give this gospel. Evangelical Christians, which is what we're supposed to be called, uh, Christians who believe that life and death hang in the, uh, the wind out there, they are uh, hanging in the balance, and the only thing that separates a person from hell is a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ, and my love for them motivates me to share that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ with them. Another quote from the Baptist Faith and Message is, The new birth of man's spirit by God's Holy Spirit means a birth of love for others. Uh, let's go all the way back to the first thing Paul prayed for. If you are growing in your love for God, then secondly, you will grow in your love for others. And how can you say you love others if you're not concerned with their eternal destiny? And so that love is the motivation for evangelism, one of the works of righteousness. The more you grow in love, excellence, and integrity, the less you will find yourself saying, do I have to, and the more you will find yourself saying, you mean I get to. And it becomes a desire of yours to want to keep the commands of God. And, and the Apostle John says, and those commands will no longer be burdensome for you because that will be what you desire to do. The good works, the fruits of righteousness that are supposed to characterize our lives do not do the evangelism for us, but they help aid us in the work of being a witness for Jesus Christ. Let me, I, I wanted to emphasize that because we live in a, uh, a church world today that tries to escape evangelism by saying, well, I live it out every day, so I really don't have to say anything. There's only one uh, significant problem with that. Uh, and, and I want to read it from the Baptist Faith and Message, but then I want you to see it from God's Word, which is most authoritative. It is the duty of every child of God to seek constantly to win the loss to Christ by verbal witness. That verbal witness should be undergirded by a Christian lifestyle. What that means is evangelism is speaking the gospel. Your life should support the message that you're speaking. Turn to Romans chapter 10. I want you to see the importance of verbalizing the gospel. Romans chapter 10. And look at verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Now listen, verse 7. So then faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. What that means is, evangelism has not taken place until the gospel has become audible. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing of what? Hearing the Word of God. We have to make the Word of God audible in order for someone to come to faith in Jesus Christ. So it is extremely important for us to recognize in producing all of these fruits of righteousness that Paul is praying for. In producing all of these good works, let us also make sure that we are vocalizing the gospel. And then what those good works will do? 
is they will prove that we ourselves believe the gospel. I'm sharing something with you that has changed my life. Just look at my life and see all the differences because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. So it's a both and. It's not a, an either or. And I think that if you did a, a little word study as you go through the New Testament... Uh, you will not find a single disciple in the the New Testament whose testimony is, we came to Christ by watching the other disciples. It is all a result of the message being heard, the message being preached, the gospel being shared. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It is necessary to verbalize the gospel. We must make sure that we are living out the gospel as well through our fruits of righteousness. Uh, But there's one other thing we need to recognize before parting from this section of the verse. And, And that is that in Paul's prayer, he took the time to identify where these good works come from. So so look back at Philippians chapter one, verse eleven. Being filled or having been filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. They are produced by Jesus Christ. Why do you think that is? I'm excited that God set this whole faith thing up in such a way that He gets all the credit. Because our ultimate reason for existence, which we'll briefly look at in a moment, is to glorify Him. And so the work of salvation is His. We give glory to Him for saving us, for redeeming us from our sin. When we were enemies of His, Romans 5, 8, Christ was dying on the cross for our sin to rescue us from our sin. But then even after that, He... Uh, the Holy Spirit moves in, and through Jesus Christ, these works begin to to flow out of us. And the moment we think, hey, here's something I can take credit for, I can take credit for all the good works that I'm producing now as a Christian. No, those good works are coming from Christ that now lives within you. So you say, well, how am I supposed to grow in producing them? By growing closer to Jesus Christ. So that he can be more visible in you and you can be less visible. What did uh, John pray? Lord, please let me decrease as you increase. What is that a prayer of? That is a prayer of please help the flesh to get out of the way so that works of righteousness can become more visible. We are not capable of producing these fruits of righteousness ourselves. They are the result result of Christ in us, and the closer we grow to Him, the more fruits of righteousness you should see in us. That's another reason why Jesus taught that you can know a tree by their fruits. But He used another illustration in John chapter 15. I'd like for you to turn there with me. John chapter 15, you, you probably know this passage as the vine. Jesus is the vine. Keep in mind the statement I just made that the closer you grow to Jesus, the more fruits of righteousness people should be able to see in you. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that produ- that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches." He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. 
If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Abide in the vine, fruits will be the result. Grow closer to the vine, you will produce more fruits. It is God's purpose to produce good works through His children. Uh, one of my favorite passages, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, which leads us to the last essential that, that Paul prayed for, uh, that we're going to cover at a later date. We're not going to get too in detail with it today, but at the end of verse 11, all of this is so that God can be glorified and praised. That's why we exist. The fifth essential to the glory and praise of God in growing in godliness is the ultimate goal of all the rest. The reason why we exist is to glorify God and to bring Him praise. Uh, there's a lot of people that waste a lot of time trying to determine what God's will for their life is. And while they're trying to determine, they remain idle in their walk. When as we've already been told what His will for our life is, and that is that we glorify Him in all that we do. And we advance forward in a growing fashion in attempting to do that. The first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism is what is the chief end of man? What is the main reason why we exist? Who knows the answer to that question? And, yeah, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Our purpose for breathing is to bring God glory and praise. That is why we grow in love, we grow in approving that which is excellent, we grow in sincerity and blamelessness, and we grow in good works is to the glory and praise of God. And I just want to leave you with these uh, four short passages. John 15, 8, that we just read. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. And Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And a very popular verse, Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath, what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. A few questions in, in closing. Question number one is a personal question. Are you growing in godliness? Because we now have a scorecard. Am I growing in these areas? Question number two, are we as a body of believers growing in godliness? And then question number three is, do you have a growing desire to praise and glorify God more and more each day than you did the day before. That desire will produce fruits of righteousness in you. May that be our prayer today. Let's bow our heads. Father, it truly is our desire to please you. Although there are many distractions that tend to get in the way of that, we want to please you and praise you and glorify you more today than we did yesterday or any day prior. Lord, you have given us the ability to produce fruits of righteousness. May we draw closer to Jesus Christ so that more of those fruits will be displayed.
And Father, in the midst of all the distractions, whether it's health, whether it's uh, hardship, whether it's um, crisis, circumstances, sin, temptation, I pray, Lord, today that you will create in us a, a pure heart, that you will cleanse us and forgive us of our sins, and that you will continue to produce more and more fruits of righteousness in our lives each day that you leave us here on this earth. Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Make us more like him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.